Professor John Dowling, welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. How are you? I'm fine, although <laughs> yeah. a little tired. I left Paris this morning at uh, 10 a.m. our time. <laughs> oh, wow. And now yeah. you are, you're coming from, where are you now? I'm in Cambridge. You're in Sitting Cambridge. In at right. Harvard University, right. And Fantastic. hello from me too, uh, uh, John. It's just an absolute honour to have you uh, have you in here. We've we've just read out a few things to our, uh, our our wonderful listeners that you've been doing, and we've told them that unfortunately we can't read out all of your <laughs> capacities and achievements. And uh, uh, anyway, I'm just really really uh, honoured to have you here. It's great. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'd like to be with you. Would we be able to start with just a little bit of um, some career highlights of yours so that our listeners have, a, have an idea of sort of where you've come from in the world of neurobiology? Because you have a rather sure. distinguished career. I'd be, I'd be delighted to do it. Actually, my scientific career goes way back to my undergraduate days at Harvard. Uh, and I was headed uh, towards medical school. And in the junior, my junior year, I took a course with a man by the name of George Wall. Right. He was a fabulous lecturer. He also was a super scientist. He discovered the role of vitamin A in vision. Ah, and uh -huh. uh, he, uh, uh, okay. I don't know how much we want to get into that, but of course, vitamin A aldehyde, a slightly oxidized form of vitamin A, serves as the chromophore for all of the visual pigments. That is, it's what absorbs the light and starts vision. And right. uh, he won a Nobel Prize for that. Anyway, uh, it was a biochemistry course that he was teaching, and uh, he started off the first semester talking about the great metabolic pathways. Well, any one of your listeners and you, if you've had introductory biochemistry, that's really dull material. But he really brought it alive. <laughs> he did. And so in the second semester of the course, I approached him and asked if I could uh, spend the summer in his laboratory and learn some scientific techniques. And he accepted me into the laboratory. And uh, when I got there that summer, I was just fascinated by doing biomedical research. Yeah. I studied first the photoreceptors and vitamin A deficiency. The last year at Harvard, I did nothing but work in the, in the laboratory, and that was great fun. But I did go off to medical school, but after two years, decided uh, to take one more year to do just research. So I took a leave of absence. I'm still on that leave of absence. <laughs> <laughs> this is the year of that leave of absence. No oh, regrets. Wow. So, and uh, and I hence your, your... I then got a PhD. It was before the, the days of MD PhD. And uh, after I finished that, uh, I was asked by the department if I'd like to stay on for a few years as an, a junior faculty member and start my own laboratory, which I did do. And initially I studied photoreceptors, the extension of the work that I did with George Wall on photoreceptors. Yeah. But then one day, just after I had learned how to uh, do electron microscopy, I made an interesting discovery. And that is that I knew virtually nothing about what else is in the retina besides the photoreceptors. Of course, everybody today knows that there are, in addition to the photoreceptors, yeah. four major types of neurons in the retina. And uh, I was looking at the uh, terminals of the photoreceptors, at the synaptic terminals, where they pass on information to the second order cells. And I noticed that one of the cells that we thought was a glial cell was making a synapse with the photoreceptors. And that fascinated me. Uh, and so started wondering what was going on beyond the photoreceptors in the retina. Uh, and uh, that started me off on an analysis of the retina that's kept me busy ever since. <laughs> uh, well, more than 50 years. Um, uh, right. That what we thought was a, a glial cell has turned out to be a neuron. It's called a horizontal cell. 
Anyway, to make a long story short, photoreceptors activate two types of, uh, of, of second order cells. All of a sudden, my screen has become dark. Oh, yeah, we, we've still got you. You're fine. You, um, we're fine. Okay, then. Oh, are you still there? Yeah, we're yes, here. We're still here. Yeah. Okay, it just went off. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've probably got a screensaver turn, turned on. So. Okay. Anyway. Move the mouse over the screen every now and then. It'll stop that happening. And it'll come back. Okay, no problem. You can edit that out, hopefully. Oh, we, we won't. So anyway, yeah. I, I became quite interested then in the wiring of the diagram uh, of the retina. How do the neurons connect with one another? And we began to work out sort of the connectivity of the retina, if you will. Yeah. Uh, from there, the, the question was, well, how do the neurons beyond the photoreceptors respond to light? And so uh, with a graduate student, I began to record from the individual neurons, which we were just learning how to do at the single cell level at that time. This is back in about the mid 60s. And from there, we got interested uh, in what, how do the synapses work? And of course, at that point, it was becoming clear that uh, for the most part, synapses work chemically. That is a neuron that's excited and is act, passing on information to a ne another neuron uh, releases a chemical that then either excites or inhibits the second order cell and so on and so forth. So we went mm -hmm. from photoreceptors to second order cells and from there to the third order cells of which there are two. The second order cells were horizontal cells who I've said just a little bit about uh, and then uh, the second second order cell is called a bipolar cell. It carries information from the outer retina to the inner retina. The horizontal cell, on the other hand, it keeps its processes within the outer retina and mediates lateral inhibition. Mm. Uh, so uh, we then moved on from the outer retina to the inner retina. And again, there are two cells involved. One is called the ganglion cell that gets the information from the bipolar cell, it has a long axon that runs along the surface of the retina, collects at the optic disc, and then carries that visual information from the retina to the rest of the brain. Uh, the other type of cell in the inner retina is called an amacrine cell, very interesting cell, especially in those days, because it didn't seem to have an axon. In other words, all its processes were more or less the same. And uh, uh, it, it, in other words, the processes that it, it extended out, we call them dendrites, were in point of fact both pre- and postsynaptic. Right. And uh, that, again, has turned out to be a very interesting finding. From there, we went on to uh, try to understand then how the synapses work, the chemicals that they use to pass information from one cell to the next. And, and, and uh, initially we were interested in the major excitatory and inhibitory synapses, just like the rest of the brain, and I should emphasize that the retina is a true part of the brain pushed right. out into the eye during development. <clears throat> and uh, the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the retina is the same as the major excitatory transmitter in the rest of the brain, glutamate. And the inhibitory transmitters we find in the retina are again the same as the major inhibitory neurotransmitters in the brain, GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, and glycine. But then um, I had a visitor from Sweden come to the laboratory, and he was interested in other substances released by neurons, the so-called monoamines, mm. serotonin, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and so on and so forth. And uh, he was curious, one, what they were doing, and two, uh, how prominent were they in the retina? He had shown by using a specialized technique that there did seem to be a certain small cadre of cells that use dopamine. And uh, 
that fascinated me and spent then a number of years studying the effects of dopamine in the retina. And from that came the realization that rather than just exciting or inhibiting neurons, that dopamine acted more like a hormone. In other words, when it was released at a synapse on the postsynaptic cell, rather than opening or closing channels causing fast excitation or inhibition, it changed the biochemistry of the cell and wow. indeed activated what we call second messengers that then had the capability of changing many features of the postsynaptic cells, changing, for example, how the uh, channels that admit ions into the cell, how, how fast they act or for how long they act and so on and so forth. It, uh, the neuromodulators, dopamine included, can change the metabolism of the cell as well. But even more exciting and interesting, and this was shown by a number of people, not so much our laboratory, but this was all happening in the 70s, that a substance like dopamine, when it activated a second messenger in a postsynaptic cell, actually could activate um, proteins called transcription factors that would then change gene expression in the cell. In other words, fundamentally changing the biochemistry of the cell. And uh, uh, that has been studied intensively since. We've gone on to study the genetics of the retina and so on and so forth. Uh, but neuromodulation really brings us to the main topic that I thought it would be worthwhile talking about today. Yes, and that please. is that, that then, through synaptic action, neuromodulatory synaptic action, the brain can be modified very substantially. And mm. Whereas we've long known that the young brain is very modifiable, and that mm -hmm. goes back to the classic work of, of Hubel and Weasel, Dave Hubel and Torsten Weasel here at the Harvard Medical School, that indeed, that whereas the major synaptic organization is present at birth, that if you change the uh, light coming into the eye, particularly focused light, that you can change the properties of the neurons very substantially and more or less permanently, although that's not quite right. At least that's our understanding today. Right. And, and right. so all of a sudden we became, came to realize that uh, the brain is very modifiable, more mm -hmm. so in the young, but now we have very good evidence that it's very modifiable, or at least partially modifiable in adults. And the mechanisms underlying neuromodulation, <clears throat> and that we had been studying in the retina, uh, are uh, similar to those underlying memory and learning. And uh, we can certainly all learn things throughout our lives. So mm. the realization then that at synapses, not only can you excite and inhibit neurons, but then to modify the cells more or less permanently by changing their biochemistry was a real paradigm shift in our thinking about how the brain works. So uh, where does that get us to psychotherapy? Well, what we've come to realize is that virtually everything we experience can change the brain somewhat through such mechanisms. And what we know is that many of the drugs that we use to treat mental diseases, uh, you know, like the dopamine antagonist and mm -hmm. the serotonin antagonist or agonist, all are modifying synapses. And for the most part, what they're modifying are these neuromodulatory processes. And so we believe then that that's the way many of the, the drugs that have uh, cognitive effects, how they're having it, at least on a longer term basis, is through such neuromodulatory effects. And right. so 
the guess is, and I think everybody who's listening recognizes this, that today when we treat um, mental disease, we believe that not only are, can drugs be helpful, particularly for those people who are quite severely ill and on a short-term basis, but combining that with psychotherapy is essential for getting the very best results. So what is psychotherapy doing? Well, I think my guess would be that psychotherapy, just like a, 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 a drug that has cognitive effects, is affecting the brain through these neuromodulatory processes. So that in point of fact, drug therapy and psychotherapy, are, uh, although you might think that they're very different processes, may be a, much more similar than indeed we have ever realized. In other words, mm. anything we experience is what I'm trying to say yeah. does affect the brain in one way or the other. And whether it is done by giving something exogenously like a, 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 a cognitively active drug or by psychotherapy, uh, talking through things with people, trying to get them to understand pluses and minuses, if you, if you will, and I am no psychiatrist, so maybe I am not really speaking very accurately, but clearly I think, and, and it's my view, and what, it's what I wanted to, to say, is that, uh, yeah, you know, that uh, <clears throat> uh, psychotherapy and drug therapy are not as uh, different as one might imagine. Uh, intuitively, mm. I think they're two different approaches. But in point of fact, I think they're much more complimentary than that. Yeah, but, this, okay. We, I, well, I was just going to say, because this, this is something that we've, we've addressed. I mean, that's a, uh, just such a wonderful lot of stuff for people to, to, to go back and deal with. But this, I mean, one of the posits that I've been uh, putting forward is that uh, uh, the actual source of information for all therapeutic processes uh, is actually the existing human being. And uh, so when we're, it's exactly this, this idea that when we give somebody uh, a, 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 an exogenous thing, give them a, uh, an L-dopa pill or something to increase their dopamine, we're actually only doing something that has a natural or a, uh, an already existing mechanism that, um, that, it is, that it is assisting or, or aiding. Mm. And in fact, uh, clearly the biology has been... Um, has worked this out and has been doing things to stimulate certain, uh, particularly in the brain, neurochemicals and these modulating processes for, for thousands and thousands and for millennia. Uh, and one of the discussions that I've had is that uh, to some extent, uh, psychotherapy is necessary now to address the loss of therapeutic experience we get in natural life because we don't have such a, uh, a natural life now we're we're recommending people go out and walk in nature one hour a week and that would be much better and it's sort of like well sounds like a pretty good idea uh and this interaction that you've discovered uh, uh, and just one thing i just want to say before I, I leave it to another question but you're talking about all this stuff back in the 60s i mean you were there when we we're discovering the ideas of action potentials and um, uh, we're talking to someone quite extraordinary, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so uh, Marion Diamond is another one who comes to mind as uh, uh, doing these extraordinary, uh, it's one of my sort of heroes. And you, you are now another one, <laughs> which is absolutely fantastic. Well, I certainly wasn't uh, around when action potentials were analyzed by... But uh, certainly we, we did some of the first intracellular recordings yep. uh, in the eye or from any neurons and so on and so forth. So we certainly were there as neuromodulation was being worked out and some of the mechanisms of how dopamine in particular, which is the drug that we essentially focused on, uh, exerts its effects. Uh, through mm. phosphorylation and so on and so forth, all of which has been developed enormously uh, since we did that work. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. the main me message I wanted to get to everybody, but maybe they already have it, and that's great. That indeed, uh, you know, 
psychotherapy is altering the brain yeah. as well yeah. as drugs alter the brain. But I, you know, something else that I wanted to talk a little bit about that, uh, that I haven't been so much involved with but have been fascinated by is, of course, that we still know very little about the brain. Mm, and what yeah. we do know is that uh, the, the brain is capable of modifying itself in very interesting ways through um, uh, neurons that release substances about which we still know very little. And I think the, the, the nicest example in this regard, of course, is the placebo effect. And maybe you have um, uh, discussed this already with other investigators, but uh, I think everybody knows that if someone is feeling pain and they're given just a sugar pill and told that indeed uh, if they take this pill that they will feel better, that in most cases they do. Mm. Uh, what's going on? How can that be? Well, what we've come to realize is that by that suggestion given to somebody that indeed something will happen, it can happen. And whereas we used to talk about that as being, quote, psychological, there's a, there's a biochemical, physiological basis for it, especially right. with regard to the placebo effect in relieving pain. Mm -hmm. That is what we now know is that there are neurons in the brain that contain substances that act like natural opiates, the so-called encephalins. Mm -hmm. right. I don't know whether you discussed that in detail. Yes, but, we, we uh, have at other times. The locus corelius is the source of that a lot, and, uh, as well as uh, the periaqueductal gray. And there are a few other interesting um, elements that we've discussed over the time over the years. Yeah, I mean, but so. You know, we think we know a lot about the brain, and we certainly have learned a lot about the brain over the last half century, but uh, there's still very much more to, to know. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I'm sure that the neurons that are releasing various substances that um, cause an, an enormous variety of mental effects, cognitive effects, uh, we're just, again, scratching the surface. And what I'm talking really about are the so-called peptides. That is, I was, was going to ask about that. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, small proteins consisting of anywhere from five amino acids to maybe thirty or forty amino acids, which we know are present in in the brain in relatively small uh, numbers of neurons, but they can have quite uh, fantastic effects, uh, right. and. Uh, uh, you know, again, the placebo effect and the encephalins, the encephalins being really small five amino acid peptides, uh, can have an, have very dramatic effects. Uh, I mean, this thing with, the, yeah, with ketamine and, uh, uh, as an external, but the keflins, because, of course, people talk have been talking very freely about the endomorphins for many years, but it's actually right. the endokephalins, which, uh, and I've been looking at this in the last couple of years and getting a deeper understanding. And I think this is one of the aspects is that, because the, there is an argument about um, uh, whether you need to know anything about the brain in order to be an effective uh, psychotherapist. Uh, I'm certainly of the school that you need to know whatever you can know about anything uh, in order to be a better psychotherapist. Uh, but I wonder what your thoughts are about this, the value and the usefulness of, uh, of a, an understanding of the brain in being a, in having a better grasp of what it is you're doing as a therapist, or I, I don't know. What, what do you think? Oh, I'm, I'm, well, the, the title of my book that hopefully they were to send you, which is called Understanding the Brain. Oh, yes, we, we've, we've given a good plug and we'll give more to that. From cells to behavior to cognition. Yeah. And right. clearly, you know, what I'm saying is that we start with cells and we then see how they work. And that's where the great successes have been in neuroscience and neurobiology over the last 50 to 75 years and understanding how individual neurons work. And that is how they receive information how they process information, how they carry information, 
how they transmit information and so on and so forth. That's the cells. But that doesn't tell us about behavior. And uh, in behavior, what we need to do, and we're very much in the middle of this at the present time, is to understand how aggregates of neurons interact together to underlie behavior. Mm -hmm. Some of the greatest successes in this regard have been on studies of simpler animals, invertebrates, for example, in mm -hmm. which they have simple behaviors, but one can begin to analyze those behaviors down to the cell and even molecular level. Um, Perfect yes, and these, the, yeah, these deep understandings, uh, when they're brought up, and this is what I think is valuable in the, the, the book that you've done it in two parts. You've done it sort of the first part gives you the nuts and bolts, uh, which right. is valuable and important for being able to, do, you know, if you're going to learn to be a car mechanic, you need to know about the bits and pieces. But it's the way that you then seek to put it together to uh, uh, so one's from the inside out, one's from the outside, you know, sort of top back down. I, exactly. I mean, I think that uh, you know, the more that we un uncover about the brain, the more then we'll be able to help severely mentally ill people, which of mm. course is a mm. major objective of psychiatry, of course. And uh, you know, I I'll say something else, and that is that we hear too often. Uh, people poo-pooing drug therapy for helping patients. Uh, and what I recall, uh, uh, you know, and it, it still resonates with me enormously. When I was in college, I spent a summer in a mental hospital, a state mental hospital in Rhode Island where I lived. And in those days, there was nothing we really could do for, yeah. for severely mentally ill people. Uh, and, uh, you know, what did we have? We had electric shock treatment, insulin shock treatment, and then even on occasion prefrontal lobotomies. Well, fortunately, we now have drugs that really have emptied to a great extent our mental hospitals. Mm -hmm. And But drugs don't do everything. As we well know, they have side effects, and people all respond quite differently to drugs. But they've really been uh, a huge, huge, huge plus for helping those people who are very severely ill. Mm. I mean, I can remember several of the patients that I saw in those days when I was a, a college student that today I think we probably would be able to let them out into society. Yeah. But yeah. then, of course, one has to go beyond that, uh, you know. Yes, to, to, life is not to, just surviving. To yeah. manage their lives, and I mm. think that, you know, that's enormously important. Well, I was always fascinated by the um, uh, the discussion years ago. A friend of mine who ended up becoming a medical professor and rather rather brilliant, but she was saying with antibiotics, uh, this is just sort of giving the comparison of a, of a medicine, because we have natural antibiotics within, of course, but she said uh, the antibiotics only uh, actually deal with about 25% of the bacteria uh, and your natural systems do the rest. But that's the 25% that kills you. And using the medications is the one that just brings the patient back from that little bit of, of excess that sends them, well, as we call, you know, in the colloquial term, crazy. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, there's no question about it. So... You know, I, I have a, a stepdaughter who is a, a cognitive uh, a clinical psychologist, and so we spend a lot of time talking. She's quite fascinated right now uh, about the addiction that teenagers have for their cell phones. Yes, right. Yes. She's been writing on this topic. She might be someone you might be interested in having on the program at some point. Oh, that yeah. would be wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'll put her in touch with you. But she's making this sort of a, um, a, a, a very important aspect of her career. She's mm. in practice, but uh, she goes around to schools and talks about this addiction, which I think is, is a real addiction. It's a real mm. problem. Mm. Uh, yeah, you know, as, as I 
drive around Harvard. Uh, you know, I see these kids with the earphones, so they're tuned out there. They're looking at their cell phones, <laughs> crossing yeah. the street without looking either way, and I'm so afraid I will hit one of them one of these days. <laughs> yes. But it, 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 it is an addiction. Yeah. Uh, and of addiction well, is one of the biggest problems that our society is facing right now. Uh, and uh, Well, it's you know, exactly as you're saying, that the, by understanding the neuroscience, that these influences uh, have a modulating effect on the way the brain functions. Uh, oh, exactly yeah. what the modulating effect is requires you know, further research. But um, if people's behaviours uh, are, are changing and those, um, those mechanisms, those uh, cell phones and doing that does seem to change behaviour, that that has to have just just because of the nature of the system of that we've got that there will be modulations there will be things happening in the brain that are different because of this stimulus and this is a this is a bit what you talk about in the nature of how behavior uh, can be looked upon as as expressions of, of brain behavior is uh, sort of you know the uh, you know behavior behavior as to brain activity is is what i meant yeah. it's coming back to the point that we that i was making very early on and that is, is that sort of everything we experience is changing the brain. And one has to be careful that it doesn't change it in negative ways. And addictions, of course, do that. Uh, we know pretty well today the major pathways that get activated uh, when people are addicted to something. We know that there is a group of cells in the midbrain and the ventral tegmental nucleus, BTA, and that projects to the nucleus accumbens in the forebrain. What does that release? What do those neurons release in the forebrain? Our old friend dopamine. Yes, exactly. indeed. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, the basic science work we did in the retina on dopamine is beginning to have some impact in our understanding of exactly what dopamine is doing uh, to those cells a neuromodulatory pathway again. How to deal with it. I mean, I think, um, you know, when I teach uh, my freshmen and we talk about drugs and how do we deal with drugs, uh, you know, that it, it, it's interesting how they respond. You know, many of them think that we should make drugs freely available. And I sort of think that we should be moving in that direction to some extent. That is, that where drugs, we get into real trouble is when um, people are addicted, they need the drug, they have to go onto the street to get it, they don't get a clean drug, and it also costs a lot of money, which brings them in, into, uh, into crime. And I always point out that you know during the Vietnam War, we had a number of uh, soldiers in Vietnam that became addicted to various drugs, including cocaine and even heroin. When they came back to this country, many of them, not every one of them, but a great majority of them, were able to get rid of the addiction. Yes. Something that we don't see happening when we take people off the street, put them in rehab, uh, they then fall back into the uh, a situation where they have the, you know, the great desire for the drug again. Why? What's different between the veterans coming back from Vietnam and the people in the mm. uh, environments that uh, encourage drug use? It's an environmental issue. And that, again, right. is something that we need to come to grips with. How do we change the environment? Uh, if drugs were more available in a controlled way, would that be a better way to do it? I'm not saying that I know the answer, but I would love to see it, it, it tried. I read in the paper, I think just today, that Scotland, I think it's Scotland, is opening in one of their major cities a place where addicts can come and uh, get pure drug. So that they're much less in the way of overdose problems, and uh, then they're worked with 
by the professionals in that setting, but it mm -hmm. doesn't cost them anything for the drug. And I'm going to be very interested in how that experiment works. Yes, mm. I, I think so. There, there was that in, because that interesting aspect going back to the framing uh, as we've been doing about the, the nature of the way the brain is modulated. Uh, and so the environment in Vietnam modulated the brain in, a, in such a way that taking drugs seemed to be a good idea. At, at home, there are people who uh, uh, the, the environment is modulating and creating effects that, that make drugs. But interestingly, as you say, for those uh, Vietnam uh, veterans, the way in which the environment at home uh, impacted and affected their mental processes was different and didn't take them towards drugs. In fact, took them off the drugs. It's it's right. quite a, a, a yeah. And so that environmental yeah. impact. Yeah, uh, yeah. We've we've done quite a few experiments looking at gene expression through uh, just things like talk therapy and meditation and a few other. And that's looking again supporting this idea that you've put forward for so long that that there are modulatory impacts that occur within the neural network and understanding this is going to give you a great deal of uh, strength and confidence in the work you do is what uh, what i'm picking up is that's the mm. message i'm getting from this mm. Mm. going back to something i said earlier i want to emphasize the point that, you know, when I started talking about the encephalins and the placebo effect, what I didn't say, which is important to say, is that the largest group of substances in the brain, in terms of numbers, are the neuropeptides. Yeah. And we know extraordinarily yeah. little about what they do. The encephalins, the um, endogenous opiates, we do know a lot about but many other substances that we know are released from neurons, we don't know what they're doing. And mm. I think this is mm. going to turn out to be a very useful area in which to put significant resources and research. Yeah. So again, yeah. It, uh, it, you know, it, 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 I think it's a, a point worth making. And again, uh, encourage those who are trying to treat uh, mental illness with psychotherapy, which I think is incredibly important, need mm. to keep an eye on so that they understand more of what's going on in the brain. Mm. Say so, one more thing of what's, oh, I'm sorry, ask the question, please. Oh, no, I was just, I, I was just going to say on that point of, you know, uh, what we, what we don't know, uh, near the end of your book, you know, you, you talk about the future and speculating about right. um moving forward. Now, I just wanted to get a little bit of your take on, um, on what you're envisaging, you know, this, wh where are we going with this science in the near future? Well, I think where we're going, uh, you know, when I started uh, my career, and was really one of the early neurobiologists, certainly I was the first one at Harvard on the main campus. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I had my friends in psychology because I was interested in vision. But psychology in those days was a very different um, uh, air, uh, subject mm, than yeah. was neurobiology. Yeah. I mean, oh, too many of my psychology colleagues treated the brain as a black box. Right. And uh, you, know, you put input in and look at output and so on and so forth. But what's going on inside the brain? That was what I was interested in. And today, we're beginning to get at that, particularly through neuroimaging. That has right. really fundamentally changed uh, psychology. And indeed, mm -hmm. as I mentioned very early on, I just today got back from Paris, where I was at a short meeting, and heard an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about it, but it shows what's going on in psychology and uh, the things that we just couldn't have imagined. But again, the basis for this has been the imaging techniques. Now, one can criticize the imaging because you're not looking at neuronal function, but it does tell you where things are happening in the brain, and that's terribly important.
And yeah. this is, was a lecture by a man by the name of Stanislav Dahan, who has been studying uh, how to learn to read. And what he's oh. discovered is in the inferior temporal cortex, which is where we know that there are neurons that respond to very specific objects. The, the first example here was the discovery back in the 70s of neurons in this area of the brain that respond selectively to faces. This was right. done by Charlie Gross here at Harvard, a friend of, actually uh, a, a classmate of mine. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, what he's found is that there is a small area in the inferior temporal cortex which seems to be selective for letter recognition. Right. And yes. he's yes, I've seen this. Lord, this in youngsters before they learn to 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 read, and the the area is not there. Once they mm. learn to read, it is there. And again, uh, 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 children who are dyslexic oftentimes will not show the word recognition area. Oh, uh, wow. We could talk more about dyslexia and and what's going on there. But this was fascinating. Then he went on, and this is what really now is beginning to bring together the neurobiology and the psychology. After identifying this area, he then, with his colleagues, began to record from individual neurons in the word recognition or the letter recognition area. And what he found was that there are some neurons that would respond selectively to just a single um, letter. Wow. wow. Others that would respond to two or three letters. Mm. And one would guess that there may even be neurons that are responding to selective words. Right. Uh, you know, it, 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 and I think it may be analogous to the face recognition system. Mm. Whereas it's known for maybe 40 to 50 years that there are neurons in the inferior temporal uh, cortex that respond selectively to faces. Now it's been shown that it's just not one area, but six or maybe even eight different areas, all of which respond selectively to faces. But one area looks at one aspect of a face. Another area will look at a different aspect of a face, i.e. Mm. how far the eyes are apart how broad the, the, the forehead is, and so on and so forth. So that the notion that indeed how we recognize uh, somebody that we're familiar with is those various areas all looking at an aspect of face and putting it all together. So that the old concept that were there grandmother cells in the cortex may turn out to be right. Right. Where wow. it put it, it's so, but so the idea that a cell would respond selectively to one's grandmother, uh, yeah, you know, seems far fetched. That is amazing. Because there was that that again, in, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say because it's interesting that I think it was uh, it was just a few years ago, four or five years ago. The uh, I think it was Harvard, but that they did word research and they looked at the activity. Uh, uh, and they found that of uh, word stimulation, and they found activity uh, globally throughout the brain. And the, and they had uh, words. Uh, the words were grouped with associative frameworks, and uh, uh, certainly as in uh, brain activity that was occurring at the time those words were put forward. You know whether they're stored there or not is 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 a secondary that's, secondary work. Yeah, that's that's a fascinating question. We now. You know, the whole business of memory and learning, which I talk about a bit in the book. Yeah. And that is we, we understand the beginning of how a memory is consolidated. But that's then where our information really ends. We know that memories aren't stored, for example, in the hippocampus, where the initial con con consolidation of memories occurs. But th they end up all over the cortex stored. But how that happens... When that happens and what's involved, we really still have very, very little in the way of, yeah. uh, of understanding. So the, so the big thing, I suppose, when we're saying about what's happening in the future is a lot. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right. Well, yeah. I, I, the theme that I 
started to get at, and that is we need now to put together cognitive neuroscience with neurobiology. Yes. Right. Yeah. Until then, um, you know, do groups of neurons, something I said earlier, interact to underlie behavior and ultimately cognition. And, you know, yeah. we have nice little examples of the way it may work. Uh, you know, another one that's always been a favorite of mine is, uh, you know, rationality. How does one make a rational decision? Right. Mm. And what has been pointed out, particularly by, oh boy, what's his name now? Uh, great. Uh, I can almost see his book from where I'm sitting, but I can't. <laughs> But anyway, that people with flattened emotions, that is, that have lost the areas uh, in the forebrain that are involved in the, in the correct expression of emotions, if they become damaged, then they have trouble making rational decisions. Ah, yes. This is way back to the famous case of... Phineas uh, Gage. Uh, Phineas Gage. Gage. Absolutely. Mm -hmm who lost those, uh, th those frontal lobe, lobe areas. But uh, then there are examples of where people have had tumors in these areas and they have uh, um, lost the ability to uh, really have emotional experiences. So when they have flattened emotions, what, what is the case is that they don't make rational decisions. Usually we think of emotions getting in the way of rationality, but it's just the opposite. Unless you have a stake in something, you don't think it through. And, and, yeah. and, and this yeah. this thing of 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 meaning, uh, it's actually a subject that I, I work a lot with curiosity at the moment, and uh, and I'm very uh, interested in curiosity for information, which we're all very familiar with. But it's this curiosity for meaning. I think I think meaning is a is a, a, a drive. Um, you know, it's one of our seeking drives because it gives us this greater, uh, greater quality of life. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly just in the title of your book, when you're saying the, uh, uh, this, uh, what makes us unique as human beings, but understanding the brain um, gives us that framework of uh, uh, dealing with us as human beings as different from some of the other species who have their own specialities, but we have ours. And this is what the book seems to be really um, bringing together in a, in a very, mm. uh, from, a, from a, say, a very fine point of technicality up to these broader aspects where you talk about consciousness, you talk about uh, emotions, which are terribly important and understanding. And uh, mm. it's a hell of a thing. Is it, is it a huge achievement? I mean, is this sort of, I don't, it's not just swan song, you're still young, look at you. Uh, but what were you feeling when you were writing the book and bringing these ideas together? Is, is this uh, what you do when you get to a point of understanding that you get to? Well, you know, I, I, a lot of it came from teaching. Uh, right. I, as I mentioned very early on, I was really the first neurobiologist here on the Harvard campus. Uh, there were neurobiologists over at the medical school, but neurobiology, now we call it neuroscience, was thought mainly to be a medical school topic. That's something that would be of great interest uh, at the undergraduate level. But when I uh, came back to Harvard uh, as a full professor, this was 1971-72, I decided to start a course for freshmen and sophomores students who hadn't had too much in the way of college sciences yet, to introduce them to the ideas of how does the brain work? What do we know about it? And so on and so forth. But, you know, as you start teaching this and the students start asking questions, you obviously want to know and start trying to find out how the information that I was teaching in those days, which was mainly neurobiology, how individual neurons work, how that extends to the larger area of neuroscience. And of course, today, with the imaging techniques that we now have, we can begin to combine together neurobiology and cognition. 
so that we're yeah. making great progress. But we have a very long way to go. There's no question about it. But, uh, you know, that we're beginning now to see higher brain function in terms of neurobiology is, to me, very, very satisfying and exciting. Yeah, yeah. And, so, uh, you, you've, so you've been a pioneer from, from you know, the, the very beginnings here, and, and yet we, there's still a lot of space for a lot of pioneers to come yet to, uh, to learn a lot more. There sure, there <laughs> sure is. And, uh, you know, when I, uh, uh, you know, I started off in teaching the course uh, calling it behavioral neuroscience or yeah. uh, behavioral neurobiology. We didn't have the word neuroscience. Neuroscience, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it was behavioral neurobiology. With that emphasis that if we could understand more about the uh, underlying neurobiology, then we would have a chance at really understanding more about behavior. And I put a lot of emphasis in those early days on the work that had been done that I mentioned earlier on in invertebrates, simpler um, uh, nervous systems, yeah. where the cells were larger, which enabled you to make recordings from them that you couldn't do very well in uh, uh, in uh, uh, mammalian brains and uh, uh, fewer neurons and so on and so forth. And you know, some of the early studies in invertebrates uh, when Hartline, and, who won a Nobel Prize, showed how uh, mock bands, a psychological phenomenon, can be explained by a simple inhibitory circuit in the eye of a horseshoe crab. I mean, yeah. who would have thought <laughs> that that horseshoe crab analysis would be very useful? But every organism we know shows um, lateral inhibition. Uh, yeah. and that it enhances in vision anyway, um, edges and borders and so on and so forth. I mean, it's a, yeah. I still love to teach it because it's so simple and everybody can understand it. And yeah, then, of brilliant. course, the, the marvelous work that uh, Eric Kandel and Jimmy Schwartz did on aplesia and the uh, um, uh, gill withdrawal reflex. It really set the stage for our understanding of how we consolidate mm. memories. I yep. mean, it's still, um, you know, that basic, those basic ideas uh, have yeah. held up all of these years. And again, yeah. you know, Eric yeah. won the Nobel Prize for that work. And deservedly yeah. so. It was tremendous. Yeah. So and now, this is the... now we're beginning to pull apart things in the, in the human brain, that we're beginning to get notions of, 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 you know, how we can recognize faces, how we can read, yeah. and things of that sort. Very exciting things to do. Yeah, it's a very so, exciting field, a very exciting future ahead of us. Um, yes. Professor Dowling, we're, we're probably coming to the end now of uh, um, our podcast, and I just wanted to um, thank you so much for giving your time um, to be here with us and to share some of your insights, and we'll especially be letting everyone know about your book, Understanding the Brain. Uh, are there any last uh, final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, I probably have too many. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we, I could imagine that, but there's been so many wonderful gems along the way, John. Yes, well, it, it, it's, it's really fun. I so much enjoy, uh, you know, talking with people about what we now know about the brain, but then yeah. emphasize how much we don't know. But, uh, you know, every day, I mean, I was so uh, exhilarated after hearing that lecture on Wednesday yeah. by Dahan on uh, on how we how we read and you know the, the the components, I mean, clearly the story is not complete by any matter of means, but that there is a little area there in the inferior temporal cortex, uh, which the neurons respond to single letters or pairs of letters or more complex yeah. situations, and I'm sure we're going to find out that there are probably neurons that are responding to specific words that we're using all the time. Yeah, wonderful. That's, that's a wonderful thing. Right. So, I hope, yeah. Yeah. I no, thank you, John. We, we, we have enjoyed it enormously. 
And uh, I think we might ha- might just have two uh, podcasts here, yeah, Matt, uh, because there's so much information to cover. Yeah. And uh, now uh, I got to skip off because I've got another another meeting with uh, uh, another uh, colleague in in Colorado. So I'll leave you with Matt. But for now, John, for me, I'll say goodbye and thank you so much. And uh, I look you. forward to going over and over this a, a, a million times. But uh, <laughs> uh, Matt will Matt will yeah. now wind up just. And I will okay. send you the information from my stepdaughter because I think that oh, could yeah. be a oh, fascinating yeah. um, podcast. Really look for forward you. to doing that. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Okay. Brilliant. Very um, good. Well, thank, thank you once again. And, um, and we will let everyone know about this wonderful book, Understanding the Brain from Cells to Behavior to Cognition. Thanks right. again, Professor Dowling. Oh, you're very welcome. I hope it was coherent (laughs) great okay Okay. thank you very much and thank you for getting me on zoom (laughs) thank you so much great okay okay bye-bye bye-bye